All right, so um, let's start by just uh, settling the mind and coming into the space. And so if you want to get yourself a posture that feels stable, that feels like you're very grounded. Okay. Yeah, and then we just sit for one minute. Okay, so welcome everybody. It's nice to see you at Neva Shalom. Last time I was at Neva Shalom and you were at your house. Now I, uh, <laughs> or I yes, and now vice versa. So um, I'm actually not at my house, I'm in town so that we have uh, the best possibility of internet success. So <laughs> I'm in the middle of Helena and um, so if you hear strange noises, I'm like this close to downtown, but I think it should be nice and quiet. Um, this session, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the retreat, and then we'll actually go into the text later in the day. So if you don't have the text with you right now, that's fine. We're not going to start that until later in the day. So basically, the essence of this retreat is trying to integrate our understanding of emptiness. So I'm going to probably not add anything you haven't heard before. I'm using a new text that you've never seen before, perhaps. And the reason I'm using this text is because of the imagery and analogies and the poetry of it, I feel gives a very visceral, immediate impact. Um, if it doesn't resonate with you, no problem. Um, you know, we're only gonna touch a couple of the verses a little bit like last year. We're not gonna go through every single verse. I'm just gonna zero in on a couple of really um, important ones. If you love the text, it's gonna be taught all through July by uh, Geshe Yang Ten Rinpoche and um, uh, Geshe Kelsen Wangmo is gonna be the tutor. So you, if you love the text, uh, you can follow up with it all through July, every Saturday. They're teaching it at Toshida. Um, so you can access that via Zoom and I'll send you links later. So in this retreat, we're gonna be doing emptiness meditations and equanimity meditations. And those are the two topics. And the reason I've chosen equanimity as the companion is because from the method side of the path, equanimity and impermanence and looking at projections and these things point you to emptiness. But they also are your everyday life experience. And if you think about the stress of relationships, it usually boils down to a feeling of push or pull. You want someone closer or you want them farther away. Yeah, you want them to be more frequent or less frequent. And all of this is built on the assumption that 
your push and pull feeling is accurate in terms of what will get you maximum happiness and contentment. So you say to yourself, I want this person closer and more often because that will increase my well being. That will give me more happiness. That will give me more peace of mind, more rapport, more connection. And this other person, I need them to be farther away from me and I need them to be less frequent in my life because they cause me suffering and they disturb my well being and they destroy my peace of mind. And we really believe our opinions about this. And because we don't have equanimity, we're in this constant, too much, not enough, come here, go away, come here, go away, all day. So, you know, our everyday stress is very much fed by the fact that we don't have equanimity. And if you realize emptiness, equanimity makes perfect sense. It just falls into place, no problem. If you don't understand emptiness, you can still understand equanimity intellectually very easily. And we've talked about it many times. So in terms of experience, we might have little tastes of emptiness or little, you know, getting closer and closer to valid cognition. And that's going to be incredibly useful in terms of uprooting the fundamental ignorance that drives all the problems. But in terms of something that will give you immediate symptom relief from samsara, if you really were to realize equanimity, I think your daily life would be more joyful, more relaxed, more expansive. And you could feel connection and well being with anyone that you were with. So equanimity is actually very accessible to us. We just don't give it the time that we could. And if we were to pick any analytical meditation of all of the topics that we've done, and you just wanted to have one as your main theme in life, equanimity would be the one. Because without it, you can't build love and build compassion in a stable, sustainable way. Without equanimity, you still have conditional love. So equanimity is accessible to us if we give it time and attention. So in the first part of each day um, that I won't be with you live, I'll be with you pre-recorded. I have a different type of equanimity meditation from a slightly different angle. So every day at nine will be equanimity with a slight nuance that's different. And these are recordings from a Lam Rim retreat that I did in New Zealand a few years ago. And the reason I used pre-recorded uh, meditations from a different retreat rather than record them freshly is that I think sometimes um, it's a better experience if I'm in front of people. You know, it might be the same meditation, but the pacing and the connection is better if I'm in front of people while I'm recording it. So I thought for your guys' sake, it might be a better experience if you heard those uh, from a different retreat because they were recorded live and they're unedited. Um, so occasionally you'll hear someone else's cough that's not in the room and you'll be like, <laughs> but um, anyway, that's what's happening for the 9 a.m. session. And then uh, later in the day, there'll be pre-recorded meditations that are related, but not necessarily equanimity. So I kind of want us to really feel like equanimity and emptiness are our best friends in our practice. There are two companions that are going to help us make our heart accessible. They're the two kind of companions in our life that are going to take away the pressure that we put on ourselves. And both of them will also help us have better relationships and better efficiency in life. Because sometimes there's also a waiting for significance when certain people are in our life or not in our life. You know, we're waiting for something to happen or waiting to go more deeply when this person or that person is there. And I know that you know this, but remind yourself that having equanimity 
doesn't mean having equal rapport, right? It doesn't mean that you have the same ability to communicate with everyone identically or that suddenly your relationships become identical. It doesn't mean that if you hug one person, you have to hug all people, or if you don't hug one person, then you can't hug anyone else. It's not about proximity physically. It's not about ease of speech. It's about having a balanced attitude that has unbiased goodwill. That regardless of if this person is a stranger or difficult or easy or however you brand them in your mind, you take responsibility to see that that branding comes from you. And based on that branding, you have attachment, aversion, and indifference. That the people in your life are not telling you how to respond to them. You're telling them how to respond, how you respond to them. And then you believe in that story. And so we want to just kind of release ourselves from these traps we've set all throughout our day of this is a good part of the day when this person's here. And it's a hard part of the day when that person's here. You know, we want to free ourselves from that trap while at the same time acknowledging with this person, I have to be more focused, more mindful, be more careful with my speech because they take offense easily. With this other person, I know that I can have my regular amount of mindfulness. And if I slip and I say something a little bit too blunt, they won't mind. You know, it's, it's still common sense, right? But you're keeping your heart open regardless. So this text, Recognizing My Mother, the mother is emptiness, yeah, from which we are all born, from which all things are born. And usually we're used to talking about the mother in the sense of all sentient beings have been our mother, right? So it's a whole different way of using this mother analogy. And again, you know, not all, all of us have easy relationships with our mother, but remember the archetype. Yeah, the archetypal mother of, from the relative perspective, from the method perspective, warmth, unbiased love, you know, really strong responsibility and care on the method side. But on the wisdom side, it's very different. It's much more from the perspective of expansiveness, of openness, of possibility, of things that are like womb-like, the space from which things are born. So this sense of the mother, I think is very intriguing. And we're trying to recognize where we were actually born from. And it can really bring a different quality into our everyday interactions to think of this motherness from both perspectives. So if all sentient beings have been my mother, I, you know, they've all been kind to me. I want to repay their kindness. I wish them well. I, I want to develop bodhicitta. From the wisdom perspective, if everyone has the same birthright, if everyone has the same I don't know, inheritance, if everyone came from the same thing, then we're connected in a whole different sense. We're family in another way. So both ways make warmth easier. You know, really strong, heart open warmth and a sense of connection and affinity with all sentient beings. And we know once you feel connected, you're more calm. When you feel connected, you're happier. And so from that place, it's much easier to benefit other people. It's interesting. So these are the two angles we're just gonna kind of go back and forth looking at. And for this session, we're just going to look at equanimity more specifically, and then later in the day, more about emptiness. So how do you develop equanimity? You just sit and think for a second, you know, from your previous study, what are your gateways or your access points into equanimity? 
and just see if you remember some for a minute, just silently to yourself. What is my access into equanimity? But what ways of thinking get me there? If I want unbiased goodwill, if I don't want push and pull and agitation, what do I say to myself? And just kind of think, Yeah. And so, you know, one of the first ones that we look at is just plain old projection, right? That the labels come from us, that they don't come from the side of the sentient being that we're looking at. So plain old projection is something you guys know incredibly well because of your work, right? But projection in this sense helps us get into equanimity. Why? because we're seeing that, all right, if this person is my friend and they feel like a friend inherently, if they were a friend inherently, everyone would feel the same. And then you just kind of step back a little bit with some objectivity and you remember some people love them even more than me. Some people absolutely do not get them do not understand what they're about, find them annoying and wish that they were gone. And it feels just as vivid to them. You know, everything about their experience with this person feels as real and true as your experience with this person. And that is so obvious and you already know, but do you know, like in your heart, when you're in front of someone that you just crave more time with? or that you cannot stand and you want them away? Does your mind remember that wisdom that you gave yourself this push and pull? They didn't give it to you. They're of course a condition, they're not a cause, right? The causes within your own mind stream. So the delicate dance that we have to do is to remember that our feelings are information that are useful but they're not wisdom, you know? So how to like have this real gentleness and this acceptance and this self-care that knows what you feel when you feel attachment or you feel aversion while at the same time knowing these are conditioned responses. They are not wisdom. There might be wisdom in amongst the moments. There might be accurate observations but inaccurate conclusions. Take for example, someone is dangerous and you don't gaslight yourself by saying, oh no, they're not dangerous, I want them close. You know, Buddhists aren't ridiculous, right? You just say, okay, so they're dangerous because why? They do this and this and this thing that is harmful to myself and others, which means I have to be careful in this and that way which has nothing to do with how open your heart is towards them. You can have your heart open and wish them well to the same degree as your dear children and your beloved best friend and your spouse and whoever, while at the same time saying, I need to be careful. But you know, this is like pro level equanimity. We don't wanna like force ourselves there. It needs to be a gentle organic process of kind of unfolding layers of shields that our heart has built, thinking that it's protection when in fact it keeps us isolated and more easily alienated. Yeah, so you're looking at projection, you know projection, you see projection every day in your clients, you see it in your patients, you see it in your friends, but your invitation here is to deeply look at your own projections, specifically about these categories, friend, enemy, stranger, or I want you close, I don't care about you, you need to go away. Yeah, even just picture like the lunch line. Everyone's in line at lunch, 
Some people, you're very happy to be in line with lunch and you chat freely, although don't chat now, but <laughs> you would chat free, free, freely if they were there. You would kind of feel a physical ease with, and it would be an enjoyable experience. Some people, the same proximity feels, ugh. Yeah? Who did that to you? <laughs> you know, you did that to you. And yet there's still something in there in your observation that's worth keeping. So remember with all of these examinations, we're not throwing out everything. We're looking at within all of my mental experiences, what are the pieces that are accurate? What are the pieces that are not accurate? So then it be doesn't become a moral issue of good and bad, or I'm a good person if I have a warm heart towards everyone and I want everyone close. You don't fall into those kind of superficial, spiritual sounding traps. It becomes a lot more logic based in order to unlock emotion but the useful ones as opposed to the afflicted ones. Yeah, so you just use good old logic when you're not triggered to remember, okay, these labels came from me. I projected these labels, just as everyone projects labels. I'm not unique or different, but my specific label projections are individual to me and they came from me. And you're just kind of taking a very gentle responsibility and acknowledgement, which then can help you free up more possibilities with more people. Yeah, so in looking at projection, you free up more possibilities with more people. Another way into equanimity is just to look at impermanence isn't it? Just to look at the fact that all relationships change. Even if you're close to someone for 20 years, they're your friend for 20 years, there are chapters of that time where you feel closer or more distant. There is, you know, even in one day with one person, there are so many chapters of closeness and distance of we agree, let's be close, we disagree, let's have space, we're not sure, it's ambiguous, just in one day with one person. And by remembering impermanence, then you also remember the broader spectrum of your whole life and you realize people you once considered friends have become enemies and people you've considered annoyances and you didn't want near you have become friends. And how many friends and enemies have just fallen away from your life and become strangers again? And strangers becoming both. And so it's not like people stay tidy in their categories that you gave them. So the impermanence of relationships is something that is very obvious to us, but not in the moment. In the moment, it's like, this is how it's always going to be. And that's either wonderful news that we're scared to lose or it's terrible news and we want to get away from or it's indifferent news and we're distracted and don't care about, but it feels very permanent. And based on that, our choices are less skillful. You know, I mean, how many people have you thought of as friends and so you revealed too much and you were too candid in a way that was not useful. And then later they became enemies and now they know that about you, <laughs> right? right? Or someone that you very much disliked and didn't understand. And then you came to understand something about their traumatic background or their difficult family or this or this or this, or they were just kind to you one day and your whole thing shifted. Now you like them. You know, the, the sort of superficial, frivolous dramas that you see in your small children with their friends are not significantly different to our own. We're just more polite about it. You know, we're a little bit more sophisticated in the presentation of it. But it's not dramatically different to all that stuff on the playground as children. So if we remember that, then when it's good, we don't clean. And when it's bad, we don't freak out. 
And when it's neutral or indifferent, we're not bored or sick of it or trying to stimulate it. Yeah, it makes you much more able to be present if you remember change. It's almost a paradox. Yeah, you can be more present if you remember change. So that's another gateway into equanimity. Another is the deep one of concepts of benefit. So this is where we did like lots of work on the eight verses of thought transformation, the seven point mind training, all the things of the Lojong tradition, all of the thought transformation texts are trying to help us understand that our concepts of benefit are very limited. Yeah, that there's a way in which to see everyone is beneficial. And not in a spiritual bypassing way, not in a plastic way, but with genuine gratitude, you see the hard people in your life have given you so much, even though they had no intention to do so, even though they didn't want to, even though they meant to hurt you perhaps. Nevertheless, you built resiliency, patience, et cetera on the basis of that relationship. And those are qualities about yourself that you're so happy to have and then can use in a number of other situations. So you can really develop equanimity strongly by remembering the way in which all sentient beings directly benefit you, whether they mean to benefit you or not. You can also go the other direction and see the way all sentient beings harm you if you're feeling particularly clingy and attached. You know, so usually we look at the benefit because it helps us feel warmth and gratitude and connection. But if you're feeling particularly clingy and needy towards sentient things, it can help to look the other direction as well and see your friends are not always useful to you. Sometimes they indulge your bad habits. Sometimes they placate you. Sometimes they let you get away with things you shouldn't get away with. Sometimes they lead you into habits that are not the ones you want to keep. Maybe you're less kind. Maybe you're more critical, more divisive with people you cl class as your friends. And then with strangers, you're more polite, you're more forgiving, you're more accommodating. This can happen, right? So really basing this idea of what is beneficial is really up to my own mind's ability to process any kind of interaction because any kind of interaction can be fuel for my path. And I need sentient beings. I need human beings specifically. And I'm grateful to sentient beings giving me trouble, giving me help, giving me all of the things that they give me even with no intention to give, they're giving me so much. And without them, I would stagnate. Yeah, without them, I wouldn't progress. So this is a really powerful way into equanimity that is very easy to build love and compassion and bodhicitta on top of. So looking at concepts of benefit is another way into equanimity. And you know, similar to that is looking at their motivation, even if you don't really know what it is. Looking at the way in which sentient beings helping you is sort of sometimes in their best interest. Yeah, and when sentient beings harm you, it might feel like you're a threat to them. So starting to look at the motivations of other people and their projections, again, can soften you a little bit. Yeah, and you realize you are a condition for other people's stress sometimes. And it can kind of touch you a little bit. And you might not ever mean to be stressed to anyone. And you're not the cause, but you are a condition. And so, so taking a moment to kind of feel that, that for these people, I'm a condition for happiness. These people, I'm a condition for neutral experiences or indifference. These people, I'm a condition for suffering. Again, starts to even out things because at our heart, we want to be a condition for calm, joy, connective, 
feelings, you know, for everybody, right? We don't want to hurt anyone. So kind of like balancing and getting into equanimity from that direction can be good as well. So you'll do a meditation on each of those on their own, you know, just gently. And I think that after these meditations, if you can just kind of hold open this concept of how does equanimity help? How does lack of equanimity harm? Just keep it very simple. We're using a lot of words to point to the same point, which is that essentially we are all the same. We just want happiness. We don't want suffering. The expression is completely different and unique and specific, but that's all any of us ever want. And all of us are confused about cause and effect. And we're confused about our relationship of self and other. So whether touching into the shared humanity of that opens your heart or touching into the lack of inherent existence opens you into that or both, that's the direction we're going with this. So it should never be with a sense of critical self-analysis. It should always be with this kind of open curiosity that wonders if you can open up more connection, if you can open up more warmth, what are ways to do so? But you have to kind of start from the place of where you are now is fine. <laughs> where you are now is already quite remarkable and wonderful. You already have a livelihood based on relieving the suffering of others. You already have a lifestyle built on trying to alleviate the suffering of others. So everything else, you know, is just amplifying that. And how wonderful it is that we get to do that. So we'll do a meditation now, um, very gentle one. So if you wanna get yourself uh, back into a meditation seat, And we'll now officially start our motivation. And this retreat, I'm going to be using the Four Immeasurables prayer, specifically the one from the Medicine Buddha Puja, because it combines everything that we're doing in this retreat. So you don't need to read it if you don't want to, but uh, we'll just use this as our meditation, <clears throat> our motivation. All sentient beings, who although self and all appearances are dhammadhatu by nature, have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in equanimity the cause of well being, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. And letting that motivation sink in and shift to the breath. And just the breath imbued with and qualified by that motivation. Start very simply. 
one simple focus. And you're focusing on the breath with a quiet wakefulness, wide awake, bright and clear, but very simple. And now just very quietly with your internal voice, very slow and specific, remind yourself what is equanimity. There is of course the equanimity related to concentration and the equanimity related to feeling but we're talking about immeasurable equanimity. What is this immeasurable equanimity? Not bland, not beige, just unbiased, even spacious.
And you can identify equanimity in words, describing it to yourself, or you can just tap into the experience of it. Those times in your life where your warmth has been even. Even if the relationships are different, your heart was open in the same way towards all or something close to it. And then contrast that, compare it with what is not equanimity. When there is that hungry, craving, longing need to be close to some people, there is a warmth there, there is a connection there, but there is also tunnel vision not noticing the needs of other people outside that focus. Not noticing the ripple effect of harm and offense that we cause. And then there's the pain of being separated from that object of attachment. It's like a wrench, like pulling apart Velcro. Trying to get oil out of a cloth. And that pain is directly related to the attachment, not the love. all of the grief and drama and jealousy. Everything that prevents our love, not equanimity. So attachment lies and says that it's love. But it objectifies.
attachment says, I'm making this person special and this relationship special. And that means I honor it and respect it. But attachment is lying. It's actually made a person into an object. Attachment lies and says, I need this person and this relationship as it is in order to have happiness. And what it's done is made your focus so narrow and so specific that it becomes true. And only this person and this relationship is allowed to give you that type of happiness. With equanimity, you could allow yourself that type of happiness everywhere, with everyone. Attachment seems to make it feel disloyal to be happy with other people besides this one. And also aversion lies. Aversion says, I cannot have this person close to me. They need to be different or they need to be away from me. Otherwise I can't be happy. They're robbing me of my happiness. They're stealing it. And we make that so true. We make that so true. They don't make it true. We give them the power to steal our peace, even if they're not in the room. We just think about things we didn't like and we make ourselves upset again. These people we have aversion towards, we've given so much power 
and they might not have even wanted it. They might even be shocked to know it. Or they might even be delighted. But this is what lack of equanimity does. Opens the door to letting certain relationships steal our peace. We think the negative is negative from its own side, in and of itself, divorced from context, just inherently bad. So of course we must feel aversion. This is the lie of aversion. And then with lack of equanimity, we have indifference as well. It thinks this person has no relationship to me, therefore doesn't matter, or doesn't matter very much. Maybe just cursory politeness, maybe surface kindness. but I'm not interested really. Or maybe I'm slightly curious to see if they'll entertain me, but I don't really care. So indifference also objectifies these strangers are either objects to entertain or objects that will annoy or I don't care. Indifference blocks our ability to see their humanity, the way they are so loved and valued by some or feared by others but a whole human in their own right. We tend to see them as just obstacles in our way or something we hope will entertain us or give us something.
somewhere in the back of our mind is give me something or don't take anything. When indifference is present. And so then circle back to equanimity, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality, and indifference. That feeling of just warmth, connected to the human experience, wishing people well, With some people, there is easy conversation. With others, less easy. Some people we might relate to more than others, but we acknowledge that as surface and temporary and projected. Underneath it all, holding open the heart. wanting all of them happiness, wanting all of them freedom from suffering. See if you can connect back to that place.
and dedicate. Remembering that all sentient beings, who although self and all appearances are dhammadhatu by nature, empty of inherent existence, have not realized it thus. I shall endow with happiness and the causes of happiness. I shall separate from suffering and the causes of suffering. I shall make inseparable from happiness without suffering. And I shall set in equanimity the cause of well being, free from attachment, aversion, and partiality. May all of the energy we put into this meditation go towards that development of equanimity. And may it amplify into enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. Okay. So for a half hour now, you're going to do personal practice in the Gompa together. And during this time, you can uh, read, write, or just reflect. But I think it's a good time to really think about what is your relationship with attachment, aversion, and indifference. And this is a way to kind of get ourselves enthusiastic for equanimity. So rather than saying, I should have equanimity, you're saying to yourself, here's what the opposite of that has done to me in my life. So you're just really looking at your relationship with those three. So you can either um, write or sit and think, um, but we'll do that for half an hour all together in the Gompa. And um, this is also a time where if you want to write any questions for uh, myself, Ranan, Iris, or Karina, you can also write questions. And basically the, the questions will be collected by dinner time each day and then go to the next day's question and answer session. So if you could get your questions in by dinner each day, um, then uh, they can be collected. And there's a box, I think. So anyway, now um, half hour, off you go.